um, I think uh, it, it, uh, it illuminates the, the larger issues because they're there uh, in uh, qualitatively uh, with the other countries that have got hit subsequently. And uh, the, the title I've chosen for my talk is indeed the five mistakes that it seems to me uh, that were made. And I actually think, uh, aside from the more fundamental, the first three are kind of deep fundamental mistakes uh, in the design of uh, the euro. But uh, quite possibly the last two have just had to do with management uh, of the Greek crisis when it first erupted about exactly two years ago. I think quite possibly all this could have been avoided if leaders had made better choices uh, among the, the, the available policies. It's not talking pie in the sky. Uh, uh, so uh, let's see if we'll see if we'll, uh, I, I can convince you. So I'll make a list of them before I go through them in more detail. First, uh, admitting Greece to the euro in the first place. Um, and I think for those of you who are uh, Greek, either uh, immediately or by uh, uh, ancestry, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the disrespect for Greece. I, I suspect many people in Greece wish they had uh, uh, joined the euro. Um, although the latest, the latest polls indicate there's still support for, for, uh, for, staying, for staying in. Um, Economists, you know, with the textbooks going way back ever since the prospects of monetary union were first discussed, the guy named Robert Mundell who won the Nobel Prize in part for his work on this, have listed certain criteria that countries should have before they're suited to give up their own currencies and their own monetary policies and join a common monetary policy. By the way, let me get, get uh, how many people here are econ or Sloan types? Anybody? Uh, there's no, okay, so that's, uh, that's some. And uh, how many are uh, engineering, math, uh, regular MIT type? Okay. And anybody from the humanities? <laughs> okay. Well, I've got, I, I'm going to have some allusions to, uh, to Greek mythology, so uh, <laughs> maybe that'll, that'll, that'll help you. Okay, so um, well, enough of you raise your hands on the, on the economics, so I'll 
cycles in sync, and, and some other characteristics, a certain kind of intrinsic uh, structural uh, integration um, in order to qualify, in order for the advantages of uh, joining together in a common currency to outweigh the disadvantages. Um, that's the way we thought about it in the, in the 60s and 70s and the 80s. By the time the Monster Treaty was written in 1991, the thinking was a little bit different. Um, there were a different set of criteria. But, but either way, uh, uh, by any of the criteria, there's a lot of them, uh, uh, basically by all of them, uh, a country that is sort of very different, just to put it uh, simply, uh, has a hard time. And, and Greece isn't, isn't the only one. Uh, and, and I, I certainly hope so oh, they don't uh, uh, keep going with uh, you know, uh, Bulgaria and Romania. I mean, in all these cases, these are countries that could be ready to join eventually, but this is just the, the premature. And, uh, you know, and possibly, possibly, some of the other Mediterranean countries. Norway <coughs> that made its own judgment that it's too different. It's got its own cycle, it's got oil, it's just too, too different. Uh, so never, never got within a million miles of uh, joining. And of, course, and of course, the Swedes and the Brits uh, also concluded that uh, it doesn't suit them to give up their monetary policy. And so they, they never joined, even though they're in the EU, um, to talk about the issue more. So that's the first one. The second one is pretending to enforce fiscal criteria. So the fiscal criteria were the most important of the conditions that they did actually agree to in the Monster Treaty in uh, 1991. Uh, and uh, I'll elaborate on that soon enough. Um, there, there's, there's three uh, places uh, that are most relevant. There's fiscal criteria in the Monster Treaty, you know, to, uh, what it takes to qualify for a country to join the European Economic and Monetary Union in the first place, to adopt the euro in the first place. And then there was the no bailout clause uh, that they wrote in, um, saying that if any country does ever get into uh, debt trouble or banking trouble, that uh, they can't expect the, the uh, uh, central government, the central bank, to be precise uh, to bail them out. And the Stability and Growth Pact, which said, uh, it was a modification, that said even after you made it in, you're not done. You still have to continue to satisfy uh, similar fiscal criteria, which I will say on the other slide. Um, so those, the uh, first one was a mistake they made 12 years ago. The second one is a mistake they made throughout the decade. The uh, third one is a mistake they made throughout the decade, allowing Mediterranean country bonds spreads near zero. So. Um, the, 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 the sovereign spread is defined as the difference between the interest rate that a country's government has to pay to borrow, in this case Greece, minus the interest rate that the U.S. usually often well, treasury bill rates. And in the case of Europe, we usually take the German government, German books. So the spread is defined as the difference between the interest rate that the Greek government uh, has to pay uh, and the interest rate that uh, Germany has to pay. And those spreads were virtually zero, very close to zero. Show you a graph of that and talk about why that's a little bizarre and why uh, people should have worried. Um, the reasons uh, why uh, why is that why is that the fault of the of the uh, leaders in uh, in, in uh, the ECB? Uh, this rate should be zero. Well, it isn't uh, exclusively. It's partly that there was a very general underperception of risk uh, by investors in all markets during this period, 2003 to 2007. It showed up in U.S. junk bond spreads. It showed up in the, the VIX, the option price. Um, none of you who have studied economics uh, know about rational expectations, and um, I would think, uh, how can you say it, it was underpriced just because they didn't properly uh, uh, see what was coming. Um, but I have the right to say that because uh, you know, many times the right in the world at that time said uh, it's the, 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 the uh, markets are under perceived comprehensively as showing up in the sovereign spreads for emerging markets and for Eastern Europe and junk bonds and, and, uh, and the mix and all that. And it did, of course, all that. All those measures of, of risk shot way up in, uh, with the global financial crisis, especially with the, the bankruptcy, the failure of Lehman Brothers in September of uh, 2008. Um, so there was underperception of risk, uh, I would say, because of uh, um, technic technically speaking, it wasn't that the models were right or wrong. The pricing models uh, to price options or, or uh, debt. It's 
said, they, they plugged into them where the variances uh, observed, variances of covariance that were observed over the last few years or you know, 10 years of their lifetime, but they didn't take that, uh, a broad enough view as to what the potential risks were. Um, second, artificially high credit ratings, credit, credit agency rating agencies um, certainly uh, blew it. So, but the markets, the markets could, could blame that, uh, the fact that they didn't, uh, that they thought that they treated the uh, bonds as almost as safe as German bonds. They could blame that on the credit rating agencies because the credit rating agencies gave Greece a high uh, credit rating and the same with the other Mediterranean countries. And then the credit rating agencies, they blame it on, and they, they usually get all this stuff wrong and lag way behind. But in this case, they could make a case um, that it's all the fault of the ECB. And I wouldn't say it's all the fault of the ECB or the, or, you know, or the Euro system generally. But Greek bonds, just like Italian bonds and French bonds and uh, every other country's bonds, were treated uh, equally. Uh, the ECB uh, accepted them as collateral uh, all along and uh, has, uh, has dealt with them as if they are, uh, as if there's no default, they treated them as if they're no different from uh, what it's, I think it's the, the reason that, uh, to a large extent, why the spreads were, were, were near zero. So that's the third mistake, is to treat them that way. Um, the fourth mistake was when the crisis hit two years ago, the leaders buried their heads in the sand. Uh, they said what the obvious thing to do would have been to send Greece to the uh, IMF. Um, I've not included the, the slides uh, on the, the debt dynamics. We could, we could do a spreadsheet calculation of what the ratio of debt to GDP is uh, the, the, the definition of a, of a uh, explosive or unsustainable debt path is, is not necessarily that the level of debt to GDP is high. It's that the prospects are for, for it to rise without of it in the future. That's an unsustainable path. If the, if the debt level is really high, um, and Italy has been high for a long time, but if you, if you have reason to think that it will, that, uh, it will be steady and will gradually come down over time, it's considered but as of two years ago, it was pretty clear uh, to most of us that it uh, uh, was not sustainable. And they should have gone to the IMF. But instead, uh, the leaders uh, said that that was unthinkable. Uh, I'm talking about the, the president of the ECB and uh, the uh, Roman official in, in, uh, in Brussels. They said it was unthinkable. This is sort of an internal uh, matter. Restructuring of the debt is a polite term. I mean, it, it, anytime you can't service debt on its original terms, you could call that default. But usually, if you only use the word default, it's a 